Welcome to the Data Leadership Lessons Podcast. I'm your host, Anthony J. Algeman. Data is everywhere in our businesses and it takes leadership to make the most of it. We bring you the people, stories, and lessons to help you become a data leader. Today, I'm joined by Michael Schomoller. Michael is the analytics capability lead for Trexon Consulting, a mid-market management consulting firm that specializes in strategy execution, the implementation of business strategy to achieve targeted business goals. Michael has 20 plus years of consulting with healthcare, insurance, and consumer packaged goods firms on analytics and business intelligence solutions. Michael, welcome to the show. Yeah, thank you very much, Anthony. It's a pleasure to be on your podcast today. So we're going to have a good conversation today. Why don't we start? Why don't you just I'd like to give you a chance to provide a little more context on your background and what you do and how data is this common thread through what you've done in your career? Yeah, certainly. Um, yeah, as you just mentioned, currently I'm the analytic cap- capability lead for Trexon. Um, and uh, Trexon, um, we're very much into um, making sure we help the client to find their strategy and then come up with approaches and, and not just for analytics, but for technology and other capabilities to help them meet their strategic goals. So, um, you know, where we don't want to get into is working on analytics without understanding where the organization wants to go. Um, we tend to feel that's likely to kind of end up in an area where the, at least the business side of the organization will feel it was under delivered against. Hmm. Um, on the other hand, we were also an organization that um, can really go from strategy to actually working on the execution side too. Hmm. So um, some consulting organizations are really just kind of strategy, but uh, we work on the strategy side and then, you know, also then go from there into the execution. So, um, you know, strategy without execution doesn't really provide a whole lot of value at the end of the day. Right. And so Um, in all full disclosure, I have done some work with Trexon in the past. And so just so folks out there know, but I've, you know, in in a limited capacity and I've enjoyed that work. and, And I think you guys do a very good job of living up to that so much. One of the things that I found very interesting, and I will put you on the spot a little bit, um, and in sure. terms of the name Trexin is an interesting name, and it wasn't until I, I started to do some work with you guys that I even knew where that came from. Can you tell me a little bit about Trexin the name and what, what its origin story is? Um, you know, the Trex, Trexin is, um, it stands for trust, experience, and innovation. Um, you know, when I joined the firm, I, I, I was not one of the, those who, um, you know, started the organization, but, um, those were, um, for the four partners who started the organization, um, those were really the things they wanted to stress and, uh, you know, the way I kind of understand it and and the story's probably evolved a little bit over time, (laughs) but, um. Uh, y- y- you know, branding is not simple in coming up with corporate names. And apparently, um, more or less, they were kind of working late one day and went out for pizza and had a few beers. And uh, through that discussion at, at dinner and having a couple beers and eating pizza, they kind of said, oh, well, maybe we can take the, the, the letters at the front of those three terms and put them together. So... That's what I understand the story to be. It could be something totally different. But Yeah, I just find it cool that like so many brands are just arbitrary. They're just like, whatever. Yes. Somebody saw a dog on the side of the road and they're like, dog consulting. Like it just, it, there's no rhyme or reason. Trex, it actually has meaning. And I always thought that was kind of unique and interesting. And so thank you for taking us through that. Cause I, I just, I think that's a cool tie in with the name. And I think they really, I think your organization does live up to that you know, mantra. And, and, and I like that they put it into the name of the organization. This is what we do. This is what we're about. And I think that's, um, you know, that speaks volumes. So um, kudos to whoever came up with that. I think that's, that was really cool. So let's get back to your background in, in particular. What, what did you do? Like what, what brought you to, you know, doing consulting work in this space and, and why are you passionate about this, this whole data world that, that we exist in? Okay. Um, 
Yeah, it might be kind of um, worthwhile to kind of just go back toward the beginning. Um, you know, I've always been involved with information and data um, in, in really from an analytic perspective. So um, when I went to college, I got a major in statistics and I got a minor in computer science. And um, that, that was, you know, I'm not going to get into the exact year, but but that was before the the dawn of the current millennium, let's say. <laughs> um, in in back at that time, there was no such thing as a data science curriculum. Sure. But in many ways, I probably kind of took that. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, you know, really throughout my career, I've been working in um, area statistics, analytics, and, you know, really to enable that, um, you know, you know, once you work with data of any size, you have to have a certain amount of um, what I'm going to call technical computer proficiency. It doesn't mean you're necessarily, um, you know, a hardcore software engineer like at Google, but, um, you know, you got to be comfortable with working with large amounts of data and being on computer systems. Um, you know, I initially got out of college and I worked for um, a division of Pfizer. Um, and uh, it was, um, they were into biotechnology back then and bought in it and got into the, the hybrid seed area. And so I was um, writing statistical software to analyze their research experiments. Um, and then uh, I went from there into um, marketing research, mm. which is all about information and data. Um, and, uh, I, I worked at another firm for a couple of years and I spent many years at the, the Nielsen organization and uh, I didn't work on the TV rating side. I worked on the side where we get uh, track consumer purchase mm -hmm. behavior and um, we get data for, or Nielsen gets data from about 80 or 90,000 stores in the U S in, in there also around the world track about 2 million UPCs in the U S. So we had very large amounts of data. Um, we put up customized data marts for big, big, big customers. Um, so actually, you know, and, and then we, we did various types of modeling, assortment, price promotion is in, and, and as I said, put up large data marts. So mm. the, in, in, in had our own business intelligence solutions on the front end. So th those were not internal. They were, <laughs> those were our products that we sold. Right. And, and we consulted with customers on that. And um, I would say before, um, but, but before we got into like the smartphone age and things like that, where there's, you know, now, you know, petabytes mm -hmm. and above of, of data, um, you know, you know, Nielsen probably was one had probably one of the larger amounts of data in the country, and, and, it, and it was very fascinating. It tended to work in, uh, it, if you know, for somebody interested in analytics and data, it was like a big sandbox. Yeah, um, there, yeah. there was always something new to learn, and there was always a lot, and it was what the company was about, and in, in, in what the interest was. Whereas, you know, if you work for a manufacturing company. You, you know, the, the, the analytics is to support the business and the business may be about something totally different. Yeah. Well, and in, in, in manufacturing, how quickly does manufacturing evolve compared to how quickly does marketing and, and marketing campaigns and, and information you might yes. be able to retrieve evolve? And I've often said, I'm going to use this as evidence to, to something that I've long claimed. And that is sometimes like when you're building data capabilities in an organization, Look to the marketing group for good data people because they have to use data in so many capacities that may not be as common in other areas of the organization. The ability to work with imperfect information and you know unclear information and still make decisions with it, I, I find is is a good training ground for your future data experts in in any capacity in the organization. Have you seen that is is true in your experience as well, or am I reaching too far on the marketing piece? Uh, no, I, I, I mean, I would say in my experience that, that that's, that's exactly spot on. Um, very used to getting information from multiple sources, both inside from inside the organization as well as outside. Um, 
And they're very, and as you said, they're used to dealing with what I would call, uh, you know, maybe incomplete information. They maybe get 80 or 90% of what they need. Yeah. Um, but they're comfortable in using that to make decisions, you know, given some holes in the data. And, and, and I think they've learned that um, they're never going to get perfect data, but if, if they can get fairly far enough along, they're going to make a better decision than if they don't use any information. That's right. which, which sometimes is, um, I think, for, um, you know, individuals in, in, a, in a line of business um, type function where bringing information is new, they, they tend to get stuck on the fact that if I don't have every, everything, I, I have to stop. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of like, well, how are you making decisions today? Well, they're making decisions, you know, on only information that they get from dialogue or maybe just kind of putting their finger up in the air, right? Yeah. Well, and there's something to be said for the timeliness of the decision. I mean, the, the impact, there's like a decay factor where the longer you wait, the less your decision will impact anything. And and granted, you want to be right about any given decision, but if you wait too long, you may miss your opportunity to do anything with that knowledge. So um, that's exactly. tricky as well. On the marketing front, before we move kind of further along in, in your career and, and, and what you do functionally, on the marketing side, I've always been fascinated. Ever since I took a class in, in my MBA program on marketing research, I just found it fascinating. And the whole notion of unintentional bias that creeps in as you craft, you know, research campaigns for, you know, different marketing, whether you're talking about a focus group or a survey, everybody loves to do surveys now. And they don't realize that when they write the survey, they have this idea in their head that they're trying to prove this hypothesis. And it creeps into the survey questions themselves, even though they don't intend to do it. Now, there's plenty that have intentional bias that, you know, clearly just want to prove their own point. I don't even want to talk about them because they know what they're doing, but it's the unintentional yep. ones that I find fascinating. And, and, and can you talk, and I'm sure this is an area that you have some exposure to, though we didn't prep for this in particular. Do you have any experience with that and, and any advice for what I'll call armchair marketing research types of folks where you might need to create a survey for something and that's not your area of expertise? Do you know of anything that you could recommend to people as far as um, trying not to go horribly wrong when you try to get new information through a marketing type of function? Um, yeah, that's um, actually in marketing research, um, you know, you know what, what you're bringing up is known as primary research. And uh, interestingly enough, I, I was always in the secondary research side, but um, I do know there are firms that um, they have people who just specialize in primary research and they're very, they're very good at making sure that questions are neutral. Um, you know, because otherwise, as you just suggested, you're going to influence the outcome right. in, in maybe unintentionally. Um, and then also, um, and, and, and I didn't work on the, in the audience measurement side, but the audience measurement side at Nielsen had a, a sample and, and they, they spent a lot of time and effort to make sh to try to minimize the biases in that sample. Um, and, uh, you know, it was somewhat challenging because um, they have to get households to cooperate and some don't for whatever reason. And, it, 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 and that puts some biases in, but they spend a lot of time on their sample design, as they call it. Uh -huh. um, you know, what I'll say is kind of interesting in the current world. Um, so <laughs> when I went to college, I actually took a course or two in experimental design and, you know, you know one in sample design. And what's interesting is that never seems to be discussed anymore in a lot of these articles. Yeah. It, it, it's kind of like, well, if we just get more data, it will be better data. But that, that, that may in fact, you know, not be correct. There may be inherent biases in there and you, and all you do is have more data that centers around the inherent bias. Right. So there seems to be a, a, a little bit of, um, a de-emphasis at that time. And, 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 you know, where it was kind of brought up was um, in, in passing, though it seems like everybody's kind of forgotten about it. The, uh, you, you know, the election in 2016 was not as the um, prognosticators predicted. Hmm. Um, I know that, uh, you know, Nate Silver at 538, he, he's, he's actually got a 
pretty good background and, you know, he tries to do things accurately. Um, but, you know, I th in one of his blogs, he kind of admitted that, you know, probably some of the data we had was, you know, just had biases and we were all misled, right? Yeah. And um, I, I, I think sometimes that's not questioned enough or, or looked at enough these days. And it'll probably come back. So, um, but, but I think you're spot on as, as to what you were talking about. Yeah, well, it, it gets me thinking, too, about this, the notion of design in, in data and in data science and, and all of these things. It's like we have this tendency, and it's probably maybe the, the most frustrating part of doing anything kind of information technology related um, as, as you know, a, a problem solver or a builder is that everybody, because the notion of a product or the notion of technology is more tangible than the notion of design or the notion of sort of the organizational change that goes along with new capabilities, um, people gravitate to that because it, it's easier to see clearly or seem to see cl clearly. And it, and it feels easier because of that, even though it often doesn't achieve what we want it to. Um, mm -hmm. So I want to come back to, to to that notion of, you know, your profession is as a consultant. You work in the data analytics space. And you're going to be focused on a multitude of factors to help your clients be successful. Part of that is going to be technologies and products and, you know, the things that come off of the proverbial shelf. And then there's more. Can you talk about that relationship that you have between products and services and how it relates to the way you serve your clients in your career? You know, I would say, um, you know, what you touched on is, um, you know, a, a big challenge is it's, it's, it's very easy and uh, it's the same in the technology space, but the analytics space to be, you know, very passionate about what you're working on. Um, those in the line of business are not, don't necessarily <laughs> have the same enthusiasm, especially <laughs> around the, the techniques. Sure. Um, and that can be a challenge to adoption. It, it, and I think it's, it's really something, and it's something we do now is really, you know, is the organization aligned with what this needs is, is could bring. And if not, what needs to be done to get that alignment? Um, you know, I would say in the area of analytics, um, you know, everybody reads a little bit in the mainstream press. Um, we worked on a, a, a recent engagement. Um, and, it, and before we got in it, the anal, part of the analytic work got positioned internally is almost for, um, it, and it was a company that was doing uh, claims and, and, and had to come up with uh, assessments on the uh, potential liability that, that the anal it, it, it got positioned that the analytics could replace people's job. Mm. And of course, that, of course, became a barrier, right? Yeah. Everybody's concerned about their job. Um, and then, uh, you know, <laughs> and so then it, it became a little bit of um, you know, even if you're reasonably good with prediction, there's going to be times where it's not correct. Mm -hmm. So those in the line position got good at pointing out the failures, not the successes. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, you need to be very careful about how you message and manage this with the organization, get people aligned, um, you know, the other area that's a, a little bit of a challenge is um, if it's something that, um, so, so I can give you an example. Um, in, you know, my previous role when I was at Nielsen, we worked with many uh, large, um, you know, f f food and um, <clears throat> related consumer product organizations. And um, they do a lot of promotions in the grocery stores. And um, the sales managers who work with the various retail accounts, they basically have a trade budget to, um, you know, get short-term price reductions, hmm. displays in the store, et cetera. And, you know, we would model the impact of those and, and, and then build those into like prediction simulators. Well, if you're a salesperson, 
the success of those promotions, if you sell more, will help you achieve your quarterly target and your bonus. Mm -hmm. So they never like to just have the system make the decision and they just have to live with it. What we learned was they were comfortable with using it to say, well, we think it's going to sell X, but we always gave them the ability to override that. If they didn't have the ability to override it, they would push back. And I, I think a lot of that was actually relevant and fair because they invariably had information that was never in the data, you know, from work, yeah. from working with their retail partners about something else was occurring at that time, or maybe not occurring. And it, 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 it would influence sales up or down. Right. And so, and so we were giving them, you know, what I would say is good directional input. Um, but, but they were allowed to, you know, look at that and make a judgment on it and to say whether or not to apply it or not. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I think anything that impacts, <laughs> certainly if it impacts somebody's income, they're, they're going to be very careful about using it. Right. Yeah. Or if they're concerned, uh, you, there's, there, there's so much on automation is going to replace people's jobs now. You, you know, people are understandably, I think, a little bit, um, lack of a better word, gun shy. And you can't blame them, right? Um, yeah. So th there, there's a lot of, um, you know, you really have to have that organizational alignment. Um, I think it's really important that from kind of the top down, it's explained why these things are being done. Um, because without that, uh, I think you're just going to run into some challenges in many cases. Yeah. Well, and it's, you know, I've had a lot of experience both on the consulting side and on the industry side, and there are different vantage points. And, and on the industry side, you have, you know, all of the operational context, you have the, the long-term mm -hmm. view, you have this consistency, you've got to get a product to market, you've got to make a profit and all of this, this stuff. As a consultant, your job is to go in and change things. And yes. make things happen. You're a tornado of change. And I have long ago learned, and, and one of the key things that I always um, teach junior consultants especially is to recognize our job is to create change. The worst thing we can do is go in and expect everyone to think that's a good idea because people in the operational context on the industry side – have a reason to do less change. Like there's a lot of fear there. There's a lot of concern. We cannot go in assuming that our change will be welcomed or even right all the time. We need to be thoughtful on the broader context. Can you talk a little bit about, because data is all about change to me. Is as, as, as If I learn more, that gives me an opportunity to do something different that can benefit my organization. And that's great. But how does those two forces collide um, and, and you know, get to a, a new harmony where, where we can use data in some productive way, but still have the stability and actually a functioning business at the same time, despite a need to evolve something, which is generally going to be the case anytime you know, we're engaged as on the consulting side when we're engaged with a, a client, um, there's something that needs to be changed. How do you kind of manage those two opposing forces? Yeah, I, I mean, you're spot on. It's it's all about change. <laughs> certainly, certainly, nobody in consulting is brought in to keep things the same. Right. Um, <laughs> that goes without saying. Um, I, you know, I think there's really a couple things that, uh, you know, help in it. Um, it. It took me, a, you know, a, a, a fair amount of time and experience maybe to learn the first is it really helps if you can kind of put yourself in the role of the user mm -hmm. because and look at it from their perspective because then you'll start to understand you know why they may have some concerns so you, you, you have to be i think knowledgeable and somewhat empathetic to where they're coming from right. um you, you know and, and, and unless you really have a a very strong executive sponsor up at the top. It's very hard to just kind of bulldoze over people. Right. <laughs> they'll, they'll push back. Um, you know, the other thing is if it's, you know, if, it, if, if it's a group of, you know, 10 or more people, a functional area, it really helps if you can, the, the, 
there is always some who love to be early adopters. So while the while the group as a whole may have a little some resistance, there are some who definitely want to be early adopters. <laughs> and the thing is to identify them, bring them in. The thing that I've found convinces the others is hearing it from their peers. Yeah. They, they, they are not interested in, if they're in a line position, they're not interested in hearing it from the consultant or they're not interested in hearing it from the IT department. But if one of their peers says it's, this is really great. I mean, that's worth its weight in gold. Yeah. Right. Definitely. And, um, you, you know, so I think a lot of it's kind of, um, indirect change management by, by working through, uh, you know, influencers and early adopters. Yeah. That, that, that notion of, of organizational culture and like just the cultural change, it's, it's not, it's not a tight turn. It's not like you're in a sports car going around a corner at a hundred miles an hour. It's a lot more like you're on a cruise ship needing to turn in the ocean. You're not, you're not tethered to anything. You have to influence it, but you can't just force it to go. And I think that's a great point. And this is true, whether you're talking about consulting or any other kind of change, because most of our businesses, most of our roles involve change in some capacity or another, or I might argue we're not doing a whole lot to benefit our organizations. If we're not changing something. But even in our own roles on the industry side, as we think about what we're trying to get done, if we can chip away at it using the the notion of of internal influencers or the early adopters or recognizing hey we may not have all the answers ourselves can we take this servant leadership mentality and say how can we help you achieve what you need to do connect into that by adapting what we're offering versus saying here's what we're going to offer here's why you should use it instead let's flip it around what are you trying to accomplish and how I, how might I, through this tool belt that I happen to have, how might I help support that? And I know in consulting, you do a lot of both of that, right? Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, I, I mean, the more you can get them to think it's their idea, the better, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, and a lot of times it is like you go into an organization, they know what they need. A, a lot of times they may just yeah. not know all the steps involved in getting that to happen. And that's where, you know, we can come in as both, you know, the strategic view and, and understanding the big picture, but also breaking down that challenge. I think this is really where consultants, you know, make their mark in the biggest way is taking that big headline and chopping it up into bits that organizations can really take on. And I think the best consultants do it so that the organizations continue to be in that driver's seat and continue to lead that change for themselves with the support of consultants and teams and contractors and all of that, but still continue to own their own destiny. I, I fear more when the consultants have the, the great vision, specialize only in vision, and then don't have the ability to break it down in a way that's really um, feasible for the organization to take on. And that could be in a number of different ways, whether it's you know a skills gap or a financial gap or resources of other kinds or timing or what have you. We need to work within the constraints that we have, whether we're industry or consulting or what have you, we have to work within those constraints to make a real objective happen. And and if you have if, you know anybody who's listening to this, if you found yourself with strategies that are somewhat untethered to reality and that they're very aspirational, but there's no plan to get there, uh, you might be in trouble. You might you might have a challenge there. Um, have you seen that? Have you seen when you have either you know uh, clients or or previous um you know jobs where where the strategy just was disconnected from what was reality on the ground? Yeah, uh, yeah. To kind of maybe t t touch on two things. Yeah. In, in first, what you mentioned a little bit earlier is um, you know, I I think in cases where where the strategy is sound. Um, you know what you're talking about. It's chunking things up. A, a lot of times, you know, you know, the individuals in the organization who really have good ideas how to move forward are just in a very busy role and don't really have time to do all the details right. to really bring it to fruition. And you know what? What a lot of times we can help them with is, you know we can have a high level conversation and understand where they want to go and, and, and then do all the detail work. So, you know, I've kind of what, uh, one way to think about it is, you know, 
you, you, go out, you go out for a beer after work and they give you the four cocktail napkins and you know how to run with it. And, um, you, you know, you don't need a lot of hand holding from them. Yeah. Um, but no, there, there, there definitely are times where um, I think the organizational strategy, it's just not, um, you know, it's just not tied back into what the organization can achieve with 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 the, with the way they're structured at this point um i think there is a lot of um organizations um who are still kind of um you know you know maybe at the top they, they have um they have strategy <laughs> they're, they're really not strategies they're kind of aspirations if if we were a really good analytics company, we're going to have a strategic advantage. Well, mm -hmm. I, I view that as kind of an aspirational goal. Yeah. It, 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 they're, they're not necessarily a strategy how to get there. And, um, you, you know, I, I think there's, there's a fair amount of information in the mainstream press. Um, and you read about what Google does, or you read about what Amazon does, or you read about what Tesla does. Well, those are very different organizations for these kind of capabilities, I think, than an organization that's been around for 50, 60 years, in that the executives of their organization are, I think, much more attuned to these capabilities and the organizational culture is comfortable with them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for, for another organization, it's just going to take, you know, I think the ramp up is going to be longer. And it's it's going to take more um, organizational alignment to get people to buy in. So um, I've sometimes encountered where I think there is a little bit of an expectation that there's kind of an easy button. Yeah. Oh, we, we 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 bring in a couple of people with analytics background, and we give them some data, and three months later, out will come, you know, something brilliant, and it'll just be simple. It's kind of like. Um, it's kind of like alchemy, you know, you know, taking the straw and out comes the gold or something, right? It's, <laughs> yeah. it's just not, it's just not, uh, it, 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 that, that, that very rarely happens, right? Yeah. Where, 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 where you get that lucky. So, um, you, you know, I think a lot of it is, is the aspirations mm -hmm. really need to be refined into a strategy, understand here's where we are today. Here's where you want to get to. And, you know, w w what are the gaps and changes you need to make as an organization to achieve that if that's really what you want to do? Yeah, that's that's awesome. And, and you know, it's funny. I was just thinking, so we've, we've been recording for almost about 30 minutes, right? And we have these plans of what we're going to talk about. And today we were going to talk about a lot about with analytics and data and talk about, you know, that we've been talking about design and strategy and marketing. And it's all fascinating, but it just goes to show, like, it's great to see where, where the conversation goes. But I before we run out of time, I want to shift gears completely at this point. Sure, I want to shift sure. gears because... You know, and, and I know you have a background where you cover, you know, everything from machine learning and AI, predictive models, you know, analytics across the, the gamut. But I want to talk to you about business intelligence um, because data science and, and predictive and AI, they get all of the attention these days. And, and there's a theme in, in our conversation today around, you know, what gets attention and then what's what's really important. And I want to talk about business intelligence. And, and if you would, can you give me your definition of what really constitutes business intelligence and answer, is it still relevant today? And if so, how is it still relevant today? And how does it fit in among these other, you know, arguably sexier terms that have a lot more attention going on these days? Well, I would say business intelligence um you know, to ground it in something specific, it's, um, it's, it, it's, you know, taking information that's in a data warehouse, putting them into, you know, many times like dimensional data marts mm -hmm. and put, putting on top, um, you know, business intelligence tool, um, you know, the, the, the two best known in the market these days are Tableau and Power BI. Yep. Um, they tend to be backward looking. Mm -hmm. They tell you what, what happened. Um, and, and you may also be able to use it to some degree to kind of explain why things happened, um, or to a large degree, but they are not, 
they are not predictive unto themselves. Um, I, I really don't know how you can eliminate those because the organization needs to have that level of understanding. Right. Um, and you know, where it's, where you can bring the two together is you can put together your predictive analytics and then feed those results, you know, scoring or whatever in, into the business intelligence systems, which will, you know, help you to understand kind of what, what could occur going forward. So when we briefly discussed the, um, situation of like the sales manager with uh, retail trade promotions really that's kind of what we did is we took our historical data that was in the in the data mart we modeled it and then we we fed that back into the data mart and we put in we they could see what they did historically but then when they said what they were going to do go forward they could see those results on a go forward basis and I actually think that's almost better because one of the weaknesses of BI systems is they tend to look at the comparison versus last year. Yeah. Well, that's, that, that's a good proxy. Um, you, you know, what most senior executives want to look at is, you know, where am I compared to the targets mm -hmm. that I communicated to Wall Street? Mm-hmm. Because Wall Street doesn't care what happened last year. They care about this year and next year. And if we're not meeting those targets, what are the levers we can pull to maybe refactor things in such a way to, to get closer to achieve those objectives? Yeah. Um, in, in, in the latter is really done with predictive analytics and machine learning. But, you know, you can really put the two together. Right. Um, I, I think if you if you don't put the analytics in an environment like that, that in in and, and there's reasons why you wouldn't want to do it. If if like for example, if you're doing you know long term pricing strategy, you don't change it every month. You, you just it, it's so, so that would be more of a study. But but if it's something that's going to a lot of users and being used day to day, um, and allow them to you know, make decisions based on that. Um, you know, I think a good vehicle is to meld that into the in, into the BI system. Yeah. Well, and too, for anybody who's, who's listening out there, if you don't have business intelligence today and people are asking for predictive models, you're going to have a tough time, especially, well, A, delivering it is going to be a, an interesting experience to begin with. But Think about all the stuff we talked about in the first half of this conversation about change management, about you know how do we um, you know eliminate bias? How do we create a more quantitative culture? And if you don't have business intelligence and you're trying to do all this fancy stuff on you know without business intelligence in place, you're in a world of hurt. You're going to have a tough time sure. to make that happen. <laughs> and so this is why you got to learn to like business intelligence are the building blocks of data analytics. It is what you need so that you can do some of these other more forward looking things. And if and and you know, to Michael's point, if you are working with executives or you're an executive and you're thinking about how do I track to my KPIs? How do I track to what I've promised Wall Street? You need to have those basic building blocks. You need to have data quality. You need to have, you know, data governance. You need to understand how you can be using data so that you can do these things that you want to do with it. And I think that's an important you know, piece. If you don't have those, you know, those sets of knowledge internally, there's a lot of folks out there that can that can help you reach those things, but recognize there's some precursors to trying to do all the fancy stuff. Oh, exactly. I think um Sometimes that, that, that is forgotten and, 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 and it's very important to bring that up. You know, I mean, if you don't have master data management, you know, I, oh, why would you believe any of the numbers coming out of the analytics models? Right. Right. And, um, you, you know, a lot of this is just, um, it's, it's always fun to talk about the fancy stuff, yeah. but, uh, <laughs> you know, why not? And, um, but, uh, you know, I think it's probably like players in professional sports. What really differentiates them is not the fancy stuff you see on Sunday or at the game, 
but all the basic fundamental things they work on that are just, you know, they, they take practice and they take diligence and you got to do them or That's you're right. not going to be there. And, um, you, you know, they aren't for, for lack of a better term, you, you know, they aren't sexy or there's no zing factor to them, That's right. but they're the differentiator. Yeah, you can't you can't replace hard work like that. I mean, no. that, you've got to you've got to put in the time. You've got to find a way to to solve those small challenges so that you can achieve the big ones. So, Michael, we're just about out of time. Do you have any other closing wisdom? Any other thoughts before we before we wrap things up? Um, well, what I would just say is, um, I, th- you know, where we're going in around the world and in the country and across all industries is um, even though there are challenges, uh, you, you know, the, the, the field of analytics is going to continue to continue to move things forward and probably, you know, 10 years from now in ways we can't even imagine today. So um, it's the, you, you know, this is like the Mississippi river. It's going to get down to the Gulf. <laughs> it's not yeah. going to be stopped. That is, that is absolutely true. Well, Michael, it's been awesome talking with you and having you on the show today. I really appreciate it. Yeah, I, w- I want to thank you for your time, Anthony, as well as the audience. Um, I really appreciate everybody who will be listening in, and um, you have a good weekend. You too. And thank you all for watching or listening today. You'll find links and more information about today's topic in the show notes. Subscribe to our show on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. Visit algman.com to learn more about Algman Data Leadership and the many ways we can help you become a data leader. Stay safe during these unusual times and go make an impact.